Okay, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome back to the Advanced Machine Learning Lecture Series. So just to recap where we stand, um, I'm still trying to finish the chapter on advanced network architectures. And uh, today we are going to say a little bit more about uh, implicit uh, deep neural networks, and then a little bit about so-called Hamiltonian and Lagrangian neural networks, which can, so to speak, uh, be used to understand equations of motion. And then I'll give you a little bit of overview of the whole lecture series and uh, tell you again where we stand and uh, where we have come from and what we still want to deal with in the coming weeks. And then after that, it's reinforcement learning, which is a very important chapter. So uh, that's the program uh, for today. Uh, implicit uh, networks, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian networks, and then reinforcement learning. So let me start by having a small recap of um, deep implicit layers, as they are called. So imagine there is uh, this F is a building block, which could be a single layer or multiple layers in the usual setup. But now it's a more sophisticated operation. So it's still an operation that somehow takes an input and produces an output, but it's not just explicitly given in the sense that it is in usual neural network layers, rather it could be something like solve an equation where the input is a parameter in the equation and the output is the solution. So that could be the operation that F represents. Or it could be that F represents a solution of a differential equation where again x could be a parameter or x could be an initial condition and z could be the solution or part of the solution of this differential equation or maybe f consists in optimizing something some function and x is a parameter of this function so you see in all these cases the operation is more complicated but in principle, we have numerical methods to deal with these things. We have very efficient numerical methods to solve equations or to solve differential equations or to solve optimization problems. The only difficulty with all of this is that if you want this to be part of a neural network computation, then of course you also want to apply training to that and training works with gradient descent and gradient descent means you have to be able to calculate the gradient so, for example, you have to be able to calculate the gradient of the output with respect to the input. And that's where the problem arises, because for these more advanced operations, maybe you are able to obtain using your numerical algorithm the output from the input. But the question is, do you also have access to an efficient version of calculating the gradient? And so this is what deep implicit layers are about. They basically tell you that for any of these problems I just listed, for any of these operations, there's not only efficient numerical algorithm to go from input to output, but even to take the gradient. And so the first example we went after was equation solving. So imagine you have some function G, which later will be represented as a neural network. So it will depend on some parameters theta and can be learned. And you have this function G of two variables like Z and X, which could be vectors. And you want to find the points Z at which this is equal to zero. And so there are, of course, many examples in uh, science where solving equations is very important. Um, imagine this is a geometrical situation where, for example, the uh, G describes the shape of an object and you want to find where a light ray hits the object, or maybe G describes um, the trajectory of a particle that you have calculated, um, which depends on X and uh, Z is say the point in time at which this trajectory hits some target or anything like this. And in all of these cases, you want to solve equations. And wouldn't it be nice if the equation itself could be defined via a neural network? So if the G, the function G itself could be a neural network. And so the question now is, First, um, 
well, how would you find the output that is the solution Z? You would want to use any kind of numerical technique that is known. But then um, how would you find the gradient of this output with respect to the input? And the naive way to get access to the gradient would be to take whatever algorithm you have in numerics to find, say, the solution of such an equation and to re-implement this algorithm using any of these frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And then uh, by definition, this whole algorithm is now differentiable. So you can take the derivative that you're interested in of the output versus the input. But this is very slow actually, and also memory intensive because it has to store the solutions for all the intermediate steps. And so that's not the smartest way to do things. And so then the last time we saw in principle already how the solution would work. So first of all, um, what you can do is you can always plot the solution here called star of x as a function of x. And uh, if g is differentiable and smooth and so on, then under the right conditions, also this solution function z star of x will be differentiable and smooth and so on. And so then the idea was very simple. You just write down the equation that has to be fulfilled, which is this one here. So if you in insert the solution back into the g of z comma x function, it must be zero by definition because it's a solution, it must be zero for any x. And so now you can take the derivative of this expression with respect to x and you get the line uh, written down here. And again, x and z can be vectors, g can also be a vector. So uh, more generally speaking, all of these things we're looking at here are matrices. And now you have an equation that already contains the really important piece that we're interested in, namely the derivative of the output, z star of x, the solution to the equation, the derivative of the output, z star uh, versus x itself. And uh, since it is still multiplied by this matrix, all we have to do is solve this equation by a matrix inversion, and then we are done. And this is um, exactly what is the main idea behind using an implicit layer um, in such a neural network pipeline. So if we, we do this, we find the following. The derivative of the solution of this equation is the inverse of this derivative of the function g that defines my equation versus z uh, times uh, dg over dx. And so now uh, that means, in short, the derivative of the output, z star versus the input is known, at least in principle. And in practice, if G is a neural network, so is uh, actually parameterized by arbitrarily many parameters theta, then you can use any of your standard automatic differentiation networks to calculate both these derivatives, dg over dx and dg over dz, because these are just two pieces of the input. Yeah. And so uh, then you can actually evaluate what you needed, namely the derivative of the output with respect to the input. And likewise, you could also take the derivatives with respect to the parameters that sit inside the G. And so this is the main idea. This is the idea how you proceed. So uh, the recipe, to sum it up here, the recipe in such a deep implicit layer would be, you can use any efficient numerical algorithm you like to get the solution in the first place. So given the input x, find the solution z star that makes g of z comma x equals zero. And then secondly, uh, you can evaluate the z star over dx at the given x um, and at the given uh, value of z star um, according to the formula that we gave above. And both of these derivatives um, can be obtained using the usual techniques, uh, the usual algorithms that are available in any such framework like TensorFlow, for example. 
So if you look at it, what we have done is we have, even though in the end we are using numerics to get at all of these things, we have used our analytical knowledge of what is the equation that we are trying to solve in order to obtain this uh, crucial explicit expression for the derivative of output versus input. And so that's an idea that will occur again and again, and also in these other examples of implicit layers. So you use efficient numerical routines, but you also are able to derive uh, the gradients that you need. Okay. And so uh, first again, is there any question? about how this works. So people are still figuring out how power, just how powerful these implicit layers are. And uh, if you look up the literature, you'll find that people are trying whether say with even maybe only a single implicit uh, layer, maybe in a convolutional sense, you can replace a deep a neural network that has many stacked convolutional layers in some image processing task maybe. Okay, so second example is very close to physics. And that is having differential equations. So neural ordinary differential equations. So what's the idea? Um, imagine that um, this F, this block F that we are talking about has the purpose of taking some input X and this X might be say a parameter inside a differential equation, or it might be, and this is the case I'm going to discuss, even just the initial condition for the differential equation. So something like this here, I have some Z at T equals zero, which is just X, namely the input. And then you follow some differential equation where the right-hand side, I'm going to write this down in a moment, can be described by an arbitrary neural network. So you're solving this differential equation. And then you stop after some time t and you say, whatever is the result, that's the output. That's the z that I'm talking about um, here. Okay, so the purpose of this block F is to solve a differential equation and give you the solution. And the differential equation we want to look at is something like this, dz over dt equals some arbitrary neural network applied to z and possibly t. And so you see when you are changing the parameters inside the neural network, what this also means is your trajectories will change also, if you change the input X, that is the initial condition, uh, the output will of course change. So if I, for example, displace a little bit my initial point, then I will get a different trajectory and have a different output. And so now again, our goal will be to find not only the solution, this trajectory for which there are many efficient numerical algorithms, but to do it in a way that we can take the derivative of the output, which here is just the final point uh, after solving the equation, uh, the derivative of the output with respect to the input, which here is X, the initial condition. And so um, a standard uh, strategy, a naive strategy could be again, to implement a numerical equation, a numerical differential equation solver in something like TensorFlow. And then automatically you can um, take gradients through the whole pipeline. And this is actually something that I discussed and even showed you in an example when we were discussing recurrent neural networks, because this is effectively a physically motivated recurrent neural network. And so we already did this, but it's not by far the most efficient way. So we could would implement the solver in TensorFlow, but that's not efficient. And so the better idea is to follow the example that we just discussed. 
So to use any arbitrary, highly efficient numerical solver, say with adaptive step size and everything, uh, to actually solve your uh, differential equation, and then to worry about how to get the gradient. So to get somehow the derivative of the output versus uh, the input. Okay. And so how do we go about this? Well, the idea again follows what we just said. We have to look very hard at this uh, differential equation that we are solving anyway. And then we know already that the solution Z will be a function of the initial condition X. And we take the derivative of both sides of this differential equation with respect to X, and we will see what happens. So let's do that. So what we now have to consider is that the solution Z is actually, in a sense, a function not only of time, but also a function of the initial condition. So in particular, of course, Z of X comma at T equals zero is equal to X. Okay, fine. And so now if we write down again our differential equation, um, it will look like this. And we can take the derivative of both sides with respect to X. So I would say D over DX, D over DX. And again, X and Z uh, and F might actually be vectors. So we have to be a little bit careful in this case. Um, but I'm writing it um, down here without worrying too much about the indices. So the first thing we can do is on the left hand side, we can interchange the derivatives. So that's perfectly okay still. And um, then on the right hand side, we see that the X appears here indirectly inside the Z. So we would take the derivative of F with respect to Z and then the derivative of Z with respect to X. And now you see what's happening. So we have this DZ over DX, which is still a function of X and T. And we have found a new differential equation for this quantity. So if Z is a vector and X is a vector, it's even a matrix quantity, but who cares? And so we have found a differential equation for DZ over DX. Um, it's strictly speaking a linear differential equation or a set of linear differential equations because dz over dx only occurs uh, linearly here. Uh, however, I also have to point out that the, um, this function here will be an explicit function of time, even if the original f right-hand side of the differential equation was not explicitly a function of time, the solution is certainly a function of time and so this makes df over dz here a function of time. So we have a linear differential equation to solve, but it's not uh, independent of time. So it's not completely trivial to solve. You have to do it numerically. And so this is then the idea you um, you start with the initial condition at time equals zero, which is very simple. Namely, if we look at the equation up here, this is equal to X. So this is, so to speak, one or the identity matrix, if it's a matrix. And then you solve this differential equation until you hit the final time capital T, and then that's your solution. That's what you need. And again, you can solve this numerically. You don't need to do anything special. Uh, you can use any efficient solver with adaptive step size and everything. And so that's the idea here. You can do the same if you're interested in how things depend on theta. So theta is a it is all the parameters that make up the neural network on the right hand side in F theta. And you might be interested in how the solution 
depends on theta. And then you can similarly write down a differential equation uh, that you then have to solve. And it's again a linear uh, differential equation that you can solve numerically. So uh, that's the efficient way to deal with um, to deal with differential equations where the right hand side uh, might be a neural network. And so this is quite useful if you're able to do this. So I will just give you two examples why it could be so useful. So the first is you want to model some smooth flow. So imagine the following. Um, so here's my time t, here is z, and say z initially, I draw it as if it is on some regular grid. So z at t equals zero, that's of course equal to x, that's the input to our neural network layer, to our um, implicit layer. And then you evolve some differential equation, which is parameterized by some neural network, and the trajectories will somehow look like this. And an important thing is they will never cross. They are not able to cross because of the way a differential equation works, because the uh, slope is always a unique function uh, of the current position. OK, and so you end up at different points. And now you can imagine this could be useful for many things. And it's uh, in particular, it's invertible automatically. Yeah? You go from left to right, you go from right to left. Um, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between initial points and final points. It's invertible and also, of course, smooth. And what you can use this for is um, to transform a probability density. So this is yet another possibility that I didn't discuss when we discussed normalizing flows. You can literally have a smooth flow with a continuous time expressed by a differential equation, and it will automatically give you an invertible mapping from input to output. And you can also, uh, with a little bit of extra effort, keep track of the density of these points, which tells you how an initial probability density that might be defined over the initial x uh, might be transformed um, because you have transformed the coordinate system, so to speak. So that's uh, one way also to implement normalizing flows. Okay, so that's useful. Uh, another very interesting way to use these differential equations is the following. Imagine you are interested in um, generating relatively arbitrary shapes geometric shapes using a neural network. So you want to parameterize them somehow. Um, there would be many ways to do this. For example, if this is a two-dimensional surface, uh, or here it's a one-dimensional line, uh, you choose one-dimensional or two-dimensional parameters on the surface, and then the neural network would map these parameters um, to the higher dimensional space. So you could do something like, if you're interested in two-dimensional surface, uh, you could um, um, get a three-dimensional point that is actually a neural network function of the two-dimensional parameters on the surface. You could always do this. The problem is, though, with this approach, you would easily get quite crazy shapes that, for example, are self-intersecting, so that look like um, this. And this is not what you want to have. So uh, what you can do is very smart. Once you have these differential equations, you could start from a simple shape that you know is not self-intersecting. It's maybe just the surface of a sphere. And then you generate a flow, which is like the fluid flow in a, in a fluid, well, so a stream field. So each of these vectors represents the velocity of a particle that is at, this, uh, at any given point. And then what can happen is that you just solve the differential equation that tells you how any point on the surface will move under this fluid flow velocity field. And the result will be exactly what I show on the right, namely an arbitrarily deformed 
object, but uh, the way these fluid flows work, it will not be able to self intersect. And so you have a way then to describe a non self intersecting shape uh, using a differential equation that is um, whose right hand side uh, is just a neural network. And you can take all gradients through it and everything. So that's um, implicit layers. I just want to give two further examples, unless there are questions here. We should maybe do an exercise, but there are so many interesting exercises to do. Um, but this is maybe also something you want to try out. Okay, two further examples. Um, one example is optimization. So here the output is not the solution of an equation, but it could be say the point at which a given function that could be a neural network becomes minimal. So let's say f is a scalar function, that's a neural network, it's a function of two parameters. Um, and x is the input that uh, acts like a parameter, an extra parameter of f. And uh, we are looking for the z that minimizes this function or that maximizes this function. And uh, this is, again, a task that occurs all the time in physics or science. Um, and here you would be able to say, I have my neural network does not give me directly the mapping from input to output, but my neural network parameterizes an arbitrarily shaped function that I then minimize in order to get my output. Okay, and then final example, eigenvalues. So you could say that uh, your output is just the, let's say you are given a matrix and you're trying to find the first few eigenvalues, but this matrix is, um, say, is a neural network that takes the input turns it into a matrix and you want to find the eigenvalues of this matrix. Um, and again, in both of these cases, you can just follow the same recipe as before. So you use your efficient numerical routine for optimization or eigenvalue finding, and then just by looking at it more closely, there will be explicit expressions for how to compute uh, the actual derivative of the output with respect to the input. And so, for example, this eigenvalue thing we have used in a research project of ours, there the idea was that um, in quantum mechanics, the eigenvalues of a certain matrix, these are just the energy eigenvalues, these are important. And we wanted to map a geometry that is a picture to a Hamiltonian that is the matrix that describes this geometry and do it via a neural network and then go on and process it further and take gradient descent through the whole structure. And so this is what you can do. Okay, so much for the implicit layers. Are there any questions about implicit layers? If not, I want to still discuss one thing in this chapter before we conclude and then move on to reinforcement learning. And that's a little bit connected to what we just discussed, namely it's also about differential equations, but it's not about arbitrary differential equations, but it's about differential equations from physics, equations of motion. And again, the goal will be to somehow represent these equations via neural networks, but these neural networks should not be arbitrary anymore because you want to keep some physical properties. Okay. And so imagine a follow the following general setting. Imagine you are observing trajectories. Q now is the coordinate of some particle, let's say. And you are observing this as a trajectory. And then maybe the next time you're observing this trajectory and you do many repeated experiments and you want to find out 
what is the law of motion? What is the equation of motion for this coordinate? So you want to somehow fit the trajectory to some equation of motion that has to be learned. In other words, it should be a neural network. So the most naive way uh, you could proceed is um, to just say, oh, I have Newton's equation of motion and the right-hand side, um, the right-hand side is just, um, the right-hand side is just a neural network. So for example, you could say this, you could say I fit the observed acceleration to a neural network. So you want that if I take the trajectory and take the second time derivative, so Q double dot, then this should be at least approximately equal to something that a neural network would predict based on the current value of Q and Q dot and maybe the time itself. So the neural network would parameterize the acceleration and try to match these trajectories as best as possible. So this is what you would do if you consider just a purely mathematical problem. But the problem here is this approximation may be very bad in some very important respects. In particular, it could very easily violate energy conservation, even though maybe the actual trajectories have energy conservation perfectly fulfilled, yeah? because these are maybe planets moving in free space and there's nothing to slow them down. And so that is not very nice, especially if you want to use this obtained equation of motion to make predictions for longer times there. It's really bad if your energy slowly fades away. And so the question is, can we build in some physics knowledge? Yeah, this is always the question. You observe that in principle, you could do something in a general way but you have some domain knowledge, you, have, you know a little bit more, can you somehow build this into the procedure? And so this is what Hamiltonian and Lagrangian networks are about. And so I will tell you about both of them. I will start with Hamiltonian networks because that principle is very easy to understand. So um, quick reminder for everyone um, who is not so familiar, with classical mechanics. So there's Newton's equation of motion, acceleration is force divided by mass, but the more elegant way to phrase these things is to say, I have a function of coordinates and momenta, Q and P, that I call the Hamiltonian, this energy function I call the Hamiltonian, and then from this function, I can derive my equations of motion. And for us, this function, of course, in the end will be a neural network. So it has some parameters theta. And then Hamilton's equation of motion look like this. So Q dot um, equals dH over dP. So you take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum, and that gives you the velocity Q dot. And for P dot, which you also want to know, it's minus dH over dQ. Okay, so these are Hamilton's equations of motion. And what you would then want is that the observed Q dot and the observed in your trajectory P dot matches what you have here. So you would have a neural network that takes Q and P as input, and it spits out, so to speak, the value of the energy of the Hamiltonian. But the um, right-hand side of the differential equation is not directly somehow H, but rather it's these derivatives of H with respect to P and with respect to Q. And of course, again, using these automatic differentiation frameworks like TensorFlow, you can do that for no extra cost. There is no real effort there. And so then the way this would be done is, you obtain these gradients and then you minimize the deviation from the observed dynamics. 
So for example, you minimize the deviation between the observed velocity and this dh over dp. And also observe momentum change and dh over dq. So that would be your cost function actually, evaluated at all points along the trajectory. So that's a Hamiltonian network. And by construction, it conserves energy. At least it conserves this energy that is described by h theta by this NOVA network. And so that's very nice. So even if it doesn't get other details exactly correct, then at least, for example, if there is an oscillation going on, this oscillation will go on for infinite time and will not simply decay. Okay, so it seems problem solved. Yeah, so you can describe arbitrary physical systems using a Hamiltonian. You can always apply this procedure, it seems. The problem here is that sometimes the momentum is actually not so easily known from looking at the trajectories of your particle. And there are several cases where this is true. So the first thing is what you typically observe is of course the velocity, not the momentum. And someone needs to tell you the mass. Maybe you don't know the mass. Then you would need to introduce the mass as an extra fitting parameter. Okay, I guess it still can be done. Uh, but there are more advanced examples. So for example, if you have a system with a magnetic field, then the um, momentum inside the Hamiltonian is actually changed by the vector potential. And so you don't know that if you don't know the magnetic field. And so it's tricky. And another example would be if you have a relativistic particle. So then the relation between the velocity and the momentum is actually also more tricky. Again, because the mass changes, of course, with velocity. And in general, if you have complicated coordinates, for example, some angles or so, um, in which you observe the dynamics, then it might also be tricky uh, to figure out the momentum. So in all of these cases, you need something else. And that is Lagrangian networks. So uh, if you know a little bit about uh, classical mechanics, you know that if you have a complicated mechanical problem with uh, lots of constraints, like a double pendulum or so, you don't really go and write down the Hamiltonian. You go and write down the Lagrangian. And the reason for that is that for the Lagrangian, you just need to basically fix some reasonable coordinates and then the um, and then it's pretty much done. So it's, it's much easier to do these things. So the Lagrangian is not a function of um, position and momentum, but position and velocity, which is much nicer because the velocity is what we can directly observe. You just need to look at how the coordinate changes in time. And so then uh, given such a Lagrangian, the differential equation that is obs obs obeyed by the dynamics is just this, the celebrated um, Lagrange equations. So there may be several coordinates. That's why I write QJ, so Q is a vector. And then you have this equation. Now, the idea again would be that L can be parameterized as a neural network, and then you just, you just have to solve this equation. Now, there's a little problem here. You see this d over dt, and it's a full derivative. So any kind of coordinate or velocity that occurs in this part will also feel this derivative. And so this is not something that TensorFlow can do for us. So we need to get go one step further. So we would say this uh, derivative has several pieces. So first, maybe L is explicitly uh, time dependent, for example, because there's an external driving force, could be. And then we have all the cases where L, of course, can depend on the coordinates. And each of these coordinates itself is, of course, time dependent during the motion. So they also contribute to this full time derivative. And likewise, L also, of course, depends on the uh, velocities. 
And so if you take this into account, there will be second time derivatives. And then finally, on the right hand side, you have uh, the simple derivative. So this is the more explicit version of this equation. And once you are there, things are relatively easy. So it becomes a matrix equation. In particular, we're interested in this second time derivative. It's multiplied by something that is a matrix here. And so in the end, if you work it out, you just get this second time derivative vector is the inverse of this matrix. I write it more formally without the uh, explicit indices. And then you have whatever was sit sitting on the right-hand side. I'm omitting the theta also, uh, minus what came from the left-hand side. Yeah, so I, also, I only brought everything to the right-hand side and I took the matrix inverse. And so um, this is it. So once you are able to calculate using again, automatic differentiation, all these derivatives with respect to Q and Q dot and T of L, which was a neural network, uh, then you are done. Now, of course, this, um, this is a, second, a matrix of second derivatives and we have the same kind of thing here. So it, um, may strike you as a little bit. Um, so sometimes uh, when you are talking about a second derivative matrix in machine learning, you are scared because it would be a second uh, derivative matrix with respect to all the parameters theta of which there may be a million. But here it's uh, much uh, less harmful because it's only the few velocity components that sit inside the Lagrangian. And if there are 10 of them or 20, it doesn't really matter. So the effort is really limited and all the rest automatic differentiation can do for you. Now, I should say that at least a few years ago, it may still have been a little bit of a problem uh, because maybe taking second derivatives was not supported, uh, but nowadays that's not really a problem anymore. So you can write something like take the gradient uh, or take the Jacobian um, in a first step and then take the Jacobian again in a second step and that will give you the Hessian. Okay, so this is uh, what people did for Lagrangian networks and you can really apply it to any kind of physical dynamics where you expect that there is no dissipation of course. And for example, people can apply it to complicated pendular systems or maybe um, equations of motion of uh, particles interacting with some funny forces, which may even be velocity dependent, like in a magnetic field. Um, um, if you have the Lorentz force, all of this is included. Okay. Well, any questions there? If you're interested in this, there are obviously implementations of that. So I would recommend to first go to GitHub and look for an implementation because maybe the de technical details of uh, getting these derivatives right in whatever framework you prefer may be a little bit tricky. But in the end, it's only a few lines. You just need to know what you're doing. Okay. So I don't see any questions right now, then let me finish this chapter and have a brief break for a few minutes in the sense that we can see where we are in the lecture series. Still a few weeks to go. We certainly did these artificial neural networks, the basics in the beginning. Then we said something about representation learning using, for example, autoencoders, compressing the uh, information. We then more generally went to discuss probability. So we said that Bayes is the best way to update your information about the world. We went through the mathematics of information theory, entropy and kullback leibler divergence and so on. And then we said, how do we learn probability distributions like Boltzmann machines or variational autoencoder? And then the last relatively long chapter was spent with looking at advanced neural network structures like graph neural networks or transformers, this kind of thing. Uh, 
And now there are still three things that we are going to discuss, and all of them are really interesting. So the one that we are starting today is about uh, discovering strategies. So if no one tells you what's the correct answer, then how do you or how does the computer deal with that? And that is the whole field of reinforcement learning. And then after that, we are going into adaptive observations and measuring complexity. Uh, okay, so that was just a brief overview. That's where we are going. Good. So then let me start with, re with uh, reinforcement learning. So in a nutshell, reinforcement learning is about finding strategies to reach some goal. So discovering strategies. It's extremely powerful. In a way, you can uh, view all the other things we did as a subclass of this, if you like. But let me first explain to you what's the difference between reinforcement learning and the kind of learning approaches that we've discussed so far. So the first and simplest kind of learning, machine learning, would be supervised learning. This is what we discussed in the beginning. So you have many training examples where not only are you given an input, but you also know the correct answer, the correct output. And so this is like a teacher telling a student in many examples, what's the correct answer? And then you hope that the student modestly extrapolates from this knowledge in order to give correct answers also for examples that do not quite look like what it has seen before. But in any case, you need a large data set with many correct answers. And for image recognition, this means you need many images that have the correct labels already attached. Now, there is a kind of intermediate and slightly more advanced version of things, which would be unsupervised learning, or sometimes it's using techniques that merit calling it self-supervised learning. So here, we would still have a lot of training data, like lots of pictures, but there are no labels. So there are also no correct answers being given. There is no teacher around anymore. And the goal here then is to recognize and reproduce and exploit patterns. So for example, that could mean you try to cluster uh, these pictures or you need uh, to build an efficient internal representation like we did with the autoencoders or you want to reproduce the probability distribution, maybe in a generative approach, you want to produce many new fake pictures that somehow look similar to what you've seen before. So that's unsupervised learning in the sense that uh, no labels, no correct answers are needed. But then when we think of starting out from the student, when we think of a more advanced student or maybe even a scientist, they shouldn't need many examples and certainly not a teacher who tells them exactly what to do, but rather you want to be able to discover on your own clever answers or clever strategies to solve problems. And so that is the domain of reinforcement learning. The question is, of course, how do you do this? First, how, you, how do you even define what you want, what you are after? And that means you have to define a certain goal. And we will discuss that in a moment, which goals you might have. But even if you have defined the goal, how do you discover a strategy for reaching that goal? And I can already break the suspense even now. The typical methods are trial and error, but in a very smart way. And so um, this is actually the kind of machine learning that is probably most relevant for eventual arbitrary general artificial intelligence. Because the hope is that we, the end users, would just give very high level goals and then the computer would figure out with a lot of trial and error and use, uh, solving subtasks and so on, would finally figure out ways to reach these high level goals. And in science, a high level goal might be to discover something new 
that you have not yet discovered before. Discover a new regularity about the world that is somehow very predictive and informative. Okay, so that's reinforcement learning. Now, I want to start with a very qualitative discussion of what might be the elements that are important so that you get an intuitive idea. And I know that some of you have seen my previous lecture series that was my hands on. Uh, this is maybe a little bit familiar territory, but bear with me. It's always good to start with something simple. Now imagine uh, our famous robot of this lecture series. And this, mob, uh, this robot can move around in a little world. And so there's the first thing, it can move. So we would say it can perform actions. It can move around, that's a simple action. Maybe it also can push around some of these rocks. So that's important. It can also observe the world around it. And that's important because it means it does not just need to do random actions or execute a predefined action sequence. It can actually tailor its actions to what it observes. It can react to what it observes and take the correct action. Now, there are extra remarks one can make here. The most important concerns the goal. So in this case, maybe you have the goal of finding the treasure chest. And if you find this treasure chest, you will get a reward. So that's certainly true. But this reward can become delayed. So you may take some actions initially that do indeed get you closer to this treasure chest, but at the moment you don't yet even get a reward. So you can have very much delayed rewards. And that makes things difficult because how can you judge whether a reward obtained at some time was due to action A or action B that you take at an earlier time? Now, there are a few extra things I want to say. So first, the observations may not be complete. So this robot may not see the whole world at a glance, in which case it would be maybe more easier to plan a good a scheme to get to the treasure chest, but it may only be able to execute partial observations. So it maybe only sees the next few meters around itself. And then there may also be components of this world that do whatever they want. For example, here, there is this very angry looking extra character in this game. And maybe if the robot bumps into this character, it's bad. There's a negative reward. And this character, of course, is, at least from the point of view of our robot, stochastic. Because you cannot really predict what it will be doing. Maybe internally it's deterministic, but from outside it seems like stochastic. And so then, in total, we also want to distinguish two things. So there's our robot, which in this language of reinforcement learning we call the agent. And then there's everything else around the robot, so to speak, if I want to draw a line, there's everything outside the robot, which is called the environment. And later on, we will be even more precise and we will say that it is even smart to say that even some of the physical pieces of the agent of the robot uh, should be uh, really considered part of the environment and not part of the agent. Okay, so how to get to the treasure chest? Well, if you are placed there for the very first time, you just have the opportunity to do random moves and then hope that sooner or later you get a reward. But if you're placed in this very same environment many, many times, you can of course start to learn and eventually maybe you find the best action sequence that goes to the treasure chest in the smallest number of steps and at the same time avoids this angry looking fellow. So this would be one version of the whole game. But then again, maybe every time you start the game again, 
you see a different uh, version of the environment. Maybe these rocks are placed in different places. The lake is at a different spot. There's uh, different uh, places for the treasure chest and so on. So in that case, of course, the agent has to become even smarter and must make even more use of its observations of the environment because it first has to orient itself. It has to figure out, oh yes, now the rocks are placed there and oh, back there, isn't that the treasure chest where I should be going? So it depends very much on how you phrase things. What is your goal? How much does the environment change from run to run? and so on, and we will uh, see all of these things in action later. But these are the basic pieces. So an agent, an environment, actions, observations, rewards. And so when people want to formalize this, they often draw pictures like this. So there is the agent on the left-hand side, and there is the environment on the right-hand side. I put in brackets reinforcement learning environment, because in other parts of science like physics, there's other meanings of the word environment and sometimes they conflict. So it's our reinforcement learning environment, basically all the world around the agent. The agent produces actions that change the environment. The um, environment can be at least partially observed by the agent. And then there's the reward. And the typical way to deal the reward is to um, draw a line indicating that the environment produces the reward and gives it to the agent. And that is partially true. So if there is a treasure chest, then the agent gets a reward. But I wanted to point out that even if the physical dynamics of the environment are exactly the same, you could have different goals and therefore also define different rewards. So the, re the reward is not only a function of what happens in the environment, but it's also a function of how you define the goal. In fact, the environment may not even know what goal you are after, but you are defining the reward based on that goal. So that's why I put the goal uh, in addition here. Okay. And then there's the notion of state. So this would be the, roughly speaking, the state of the environment. So if the agent starts to move around these objects, then the state of the environment changes. So that's the basic setting of reinforcement learning. And then just to give you an impression of how widespread this is and how powerful, let me just discuss a few examples, at least briefly here, and maybe we can come back to them later. So one very popular way to test reinforcement learning approaches is games. For example, video games or board games. And this is very useful because the rules are very clear and it's also very clear what is the goal. The goal is just to win, obviously. And you will say, get a reward at the end that is plus one if you win, minus one if you lose and zero if you draw. So that's reward. It's also very clear what are the actions. Maybe you can move around those pieces on the board the rules are very clear of which actions you are able to perform. It's also clear what is the environment. The environment is, so to speak, the whole board plus the opponent, if there is an opponent, or the environment may be, let's say, the computer that runs the video game and has implemented lots of detailed rules that determine what's going on in this game. So you can play games and with trial and error, develop a strategy to become better and better. And this has led to very remarkable results. So probably all of you by now know, a few years ago, um, the computer using reinforcement learning was able to eventually beat the world's best players at Go, which was very surprising because Go has exponentially more possible actions and strategies than let's say chess, okay? Then next example, investment strategies. So. Again, it's very clear what is your goal. You want to invest in the stock market. Maybe you have a certain amount of money available. And at the end of a certain time frame, you want to have uh, obtained the maximum amount of financial reward. So it's very clear cut what is the goal and what you can do. You can invest or um, divest yourself of some stocks and so on. And here, again, you would 
uh, try to do reinforce. People have applied reinforcement learning, for example, um, yeah, uh, taking the data that is available and investing small amounts of money, um, or pretending that you would invest in some stock and then seeing how the stock market evolves. Next example I have here is from physics. So you um, want to control some physical system, for example, a quantum system, and you want to do it in exactly the right order of uh, controls that you apply. These might be electric field pulses or magnetic fields, and you want to achieve a certain goal, such as, for example, keeping alive the information in a quantum computer or executing a certain um, a certain computation in a quantum computer with very little noise. Then there is a robotic motion. And this is, these are areas of current research, obviously. There's robotic motion. So you want to make a robot be able to walk and you give it a reward uh, if it stays on its feet and doesn't fall over. And the actions are the uh, motions of the different joints. So for example, you can apply torques to the motors uh, or the motors can apply torques to the joints and then it starts to move. The environment uh, would here consist of all the physical surroundings, but also the physical dynamics of the robot itself. Then there is uh, self-driving cars. And there are many different levels on which reinforcement learning could be interesting. Maybe it's the more higher level functionalities like uh, finding a smart planning, uh, a smart route or finding a smart route, reacting then to new information that something is blocked or so. Uh, down to the more microscopic level, when you want to drive safely on the road, given the input from your sensors. Um, but that, of course, represents all kinds of problems on its own. So you cannot so easily train on the real world, at least not immediately or not with any safeguards. Maybe then you have to invent simulations. And the question is, how uh, faithful are your simulations and so on? And then finally, uh, what I mentioned before, if you think much further ahead, towards general artificial intelligence that, or a particular subfield of scientific discovery, uh, there again, we kind of know what are the goals. It may already be difficult to figure out how to define the reward functions. And it's of course, even more difficult to find out the best strategies. And we hope that in the future, people will come up with very smart reinforcement learning schemes to tackle these complicated questions. So that at least part of it is solved by the computer. So the computer figures out a good strategy and we do not have to figure out everything. Okay. So um, to make things really concrete, I thought oftentimes it's good to think of a very concrete example and the most Concrete and natural example for reinforcement learning is if you have a maze. So um, you might place a character somewhere in the maze. Let's say that's a little robot. And the goal might be to find, um, let's say a treasure chest, which is here, or that's the exit to the maze or something. And then uh, in this particular example, we know what would be the best strategy to achieve this outcome. That would be to walk down here and then to walk here. And then finally to find this exit or the treasure chest. But the question is, of course, um, is it always the same maze that this little agent has to solve, in which case it would indeed eventually figure out this best path? Or is it every time a different maze that it has to solve? And maybe it only can view its immediate surroundings, let's say the immediate surroundings, in which case it becomes much, much harder to solve this puzzle. And certainly it will typically not uh, find in any given maze the optimal way it will be glad if it finds any way uh, to reach the target. So this is the kind of example you could have in mind. And in this case, um, yeah, for example, the reward is clear and you would have 
a state that could be as simple as the location of this agent, but as complex as the as an image of the whole maze as it exists at a given point in time. Okay, so this is just for intuitive background. And now I think it's time to actually start discussing what's going on. But the, that's a good time to pause again and ask if there are any questions. Um, okay, so question, is reinforcement learning currently the closest we have to uh, advanced artificial scientific discovery strategies? I would say yes, but it's not at all very much developed. People are doing very modest things, let's say figuring out the best strategy to measure a physical system uh, in an economical way to gain a lot of information. Um, but it's uh, uh, not that uh, far developed. So you have examples where people say, uh, let me figure out the best experimental setup that would produce very highly entangled states of light. So that's a very nice example. Um, and that's a case of reinforcement learning because you have described the goal, but you do not know how to reach this goal. And uh, you have to figure out, the computer has to figure out how to get there. Um, but this is still, of course, much more constrained than what we think of when we think of the more general task of artificial scientific discovery, which would be more like um, I am trying to find novel behavior in a given set of experimental systems, and I want to figure out which uh, experiments I should do next in order to have the biggest chance uh, to find out this uh, interesting novel behavior. But we're getting there. I mean, this is why I'm giving the lecture, because I hope that some, maybe you, uh, will actually help us uh, to get there. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, what we think about when we think about reinforcement learning is first of all the environment in which the agent is placed and we imagine the environment is in a certain state but the state can change so we would have some state and i will typically typically call it uh, s t state at time t and this can change why can it change because of two reasons first the environment may have its own dynamics. Second, the agent may make some actions that also change the state of the environment. And then I go to a new state, st plus one. So uh, there might be the dynamics of the environment. Uh, plus potentially the result of the actions of the agent. Like, for example, the agent moving around certain objects in the environment. So the next question we have to ask ourselves, how do we describe the dynamics of the environment? And you have already noticed that I constrained myself to discrete time. So t, t plus one, t plus two. That's a typical assumption. It's not very crucial. You can certainly, even if you are interested in continuous time, take very small time steps, as we usually do when we solve uh, numerical differential equations in physics, and that solves it. Um, but for the moment, it's a discrete in time. Now, how do we describe the dynamics of the environment? Well, it could be a deterministic dynamic. So if you know the state, then you definitely know what is the state at the following time. But in general, it might be probabilistic. It might be stochastic. So this is what we want to keep for generality. And then we want to make an assumption, namely that the dynamics is Markovian. 
And I will make a remark on that in a moment that this is actually not a real restriction. But if it is Markovian, what it means is that the next state is determined, at least stochastically, by the present state and maybe the action of the agent, but nothing before that. So what we can write down is a probability of getting the state as t plus one, given the old state and the action of the agent. So this is obviously Markovian because it only depends on these uh, things at the present time. It does not depend on the whole history. Now that is a very, very general description because I haven't told you what the state is. It might be a very high dimensional vector describing something very, very complex. But it still seems a restriction that you have this Markov property. And I now want to make the claim that the Markov property is actually not a restriction because you can always play a trick which maybe some of you know if the real dynamics is not markov so there is some memory there is some long range time dependence in the environment then you can always play a trick namely you can always enlarge the state space that you describe at least conceptually in your mind in order to include so many degrees of freedom that your dynamics actually can become Markovian in this description. And I will give you an example in a moment. So uh, the example I give is very familiar because I brought it before. Let's say you have a physical system which has many particles, but for some reason you are mainly interested in the dynamics of this particular big particle. That's a typical situation in physics. Now the problem is this big particle will be hit by the small particles. And that already gives rise to some stochastic behavior. This is still something that we could deal with. But when these small particles collide with a big particle, they may collide repeatedly with the big particle, which means that there will be some memory going on. So the second collision of the small particle uh, has the small particle with a velocity that dependent on what happened in the first collision. So depending on how the big particle was moving at first, that will be remembered later in the second collision. And this is a known effect, yeah? So you can have this memory effects when uh, some subsystem here, the big particle is surrounded by another system with many degrees of freedom, they can still bring in memory. And so overall here, the dynamics of the big particle would be non-Markovian because there is this indirect memory effect. However, I can take the exact same situation and I can make it Markovian. The price I have to pay is just that I have to keep all the small particles. So now I would just write down Newton's equation of motion, which are a Markovian description, because you know what happens in the next time step based on the present state of the system. And so suddenly what looked so complicated and non-Markovian looks now Markovian. The price is of course that your state space is much enlarged. It's no longer just the position of the big particle, it's the positions of all the particles. And this is not something special to this situation. You can always do this, even just mathematically. You can always do this if you have a non-Markovian memory type of process. You can enlarge the state space and turn it into a Markov process. And I wrote down conceptually because maybe we are not even doing this ever. We are not uh, really doing the full calculation or worry about how we would enlarge the state space. It's just that when we talk about the changes in the state of the environment, we can safely assume that these follow this kind of Markov update rule, even though at first sight, the environment may look non-Markovian because we know we can always make it work if the state space is enlarged. So 
that was a little side note on why this description is actually extremely general. Okay, so that's the dynamics of the environment. Stochastic, Markov, but it's actually not a restriction. Now, um, back to what the agent does. So what the agent does is, of course, it applies some actions. And these actions are based on the current state that it observes, its current knowledge. And the way to select the action based on the current knowledge is called a strategy or a policy. And so the typical language in this field is rather the policy. And this policy, again, is best described in a prob probabilistic manner. So we can say we have a policy. And now the funny notation in this field is that the probability distribution that comes up in this policy is called pi. Pi for policy, because the p is already taken. And so that's the probability distribution for taking a certain action given a certain state. Yeah, so that is the policy uh, based on the current knowledge of the agent. So now, apart from the reward, these are already the most important ingredients. There is the state, there is the action, there is the um, state transition probabilities of the environment. I didn't mention this, I should say it. So these are state transition probabilities. And of course, the um, policy. Now, at this point, there are two remarks I want to make about the state, because I'm being here a little bit loose with the state. What does it really mean? So the um, questions about the state. The first thing is, what happens if the agent cannot observe the full state of the environment? And this is a very normal thing. So the robot can only see the objects immediately surrounding it and not everything in the world. So what about if we have partial observation? Then the question is, in these formulas, what do we even mean? Do we mean the full state of the environment or only the piece that the agent can observe? And there are a little bit different approaches in the literature here. And sometimes it's not even completely clearly specified. I want to discuss it at least once here in the beginning so that you are aware of it. And then we can leave it for the most part again. So if the agent only partially observes the environment, then the way I want to treat this is to say the following. So S will still be, for me, in my way of phrasing these things, the full state of the environment. But I take into account that the policy, of course, cannot depend on the full state of the environment. So the um, way I treat this is to say the policy formally is a function of action given state, but the permissible policies for a certain agent that only can look around in the immediate vicinity are actually more constrained in their functional shape. 
namely that they only depend on the part of the state that is actually observable. And you could uh, write it in many ways, but uh, just to make it clear. So this is the part of the full environment state that is observable by the agent. Okay. And so we always then keep this in mind. Sometimes we will not often, we will not write it explicitly, but you of course know that the policy of the agent can only depend on the things that the agent can in principle know, which are a subset of the total full state of the environment. Okay, so this is this. Um, the second question you may have is, well, if the agent can only observe its immediate surroundings, if it is smart, then it can still accumulate information over time because it's moving around and it's looking at this and then it's moving again and it's looking at that. So it accumulates information. In other words, it uses some memory. So you can counteract the effects, the limiting effects of partial observability by moving around and storing inside your memory what you have seen at different pieces uh, of the world. And so the question is then, how do we incorporate memory that the agent may have in this scheme? And there are, again, different ways to phrase this, and you have to figure out what's the best way. But um, the way I like to do this is the following. I still want to retain this um, simple formula that the policy here depends only on the observable parts of the full state of the environment. So I want to retain this. But now it seems it also has to depend on some memory. And the, way I want to treat with this is not to introduce an extra memory variable inside the agent, but rather say that the environment itself, if needed, keeps track of all the information that may have been stored inside the agent. Because remember, the environment, if we think about it more carefully, may also include, include the physical pieces of the agent, like it's a robot and it uh, has some uh, arms that it can move. So these will also be part of the environment. Likewise, if the agent has some video camera and a video feed and some memory bank on which the video feed may be stored, I want to make this part of my full state that I keep track of. So this is um, the way I want to treat it. So keep memory or more precisely, everything that the environment could, in, that the sorry, that the agent could, in principle, have accumulated from its sensory data while it walks around through the environment, keep all of that as an additional piece in the state of the environment. And so that's uh, a little bit better than assigning it to the agent uh, in my mind, because um, the agent itself may, of course, uh, have something like a recurrent neural network in order to process time dependent data. And it could change its internal way how it handles the memory and only keep the most essential parts of the observations. This is what it should do, obviously. But the problem is that will be part of the policy that will be something that the agent tries to optimize. Um, whereas the state, I don't want to depend on what the agent tries to optimize in its policy. So I rather say that everything that the agent sensors have perceived and which could be part of what the agent bases its dis decisions on, uh, that should be part of the full state of the environment formally. And then I can use the line above that only parts of it uh, will go into the decision of the agent what to do next. Okay. So uh, long story short, if we treat these things carefully, 
uh, we can make everything that I described formally work in the most general case. So this is the purpose of the discussion. Uh, some things that we discuss may seem a little bit restricted, but if you uh, interpret things carefully, they are very general. Okay, any questions so far about um, states, actions, policy, uh, transitions? Okay, so my claim is what we're discussing now is actually completely general. You could have an arbitrarily complicated environment and a very smart agent that sees only a little bit, but then stores something inside memory and processes this. And all of this is in principle included in this general framework. Now, before we go to the rewards, there is one final, um, uh, one final remark. Uh, I sometimes will talk of a trajectory. By that, I just mean the sequence of states and actions that the um, agent goes through. So you might start at some state S0. Maybe the robot is placed at a certain location. Then it moves. I reach state S1. Then it moves again in another direction. I reach state S2 and so on. And the sequence of these states and actions, I will call the trajectory. And this trajectory will terminate possibly at some time, capital T, and then I will end up in some final state. Now, sometimes, uh, the, in the literature, the trajectory also involves the rewards. So just a warning, sometimes the rewards are also included here. Which brings up the keyword rewards. So what about the rewards? So again, in my notation, uh, people use slightly different notations all the time. A reward will be little r. And this little r is some function of the current state and current action that is taken on seeing the state and uh, possibly also the state that is reached afterwards. So the whole transition, so to speak, gives rise to a reward in the most general case. So it's made uh, to depend uh, not only on the initial state, but also the final state, because possibly this transition is uh, stochastic and maybe that affects the reward. You could have simpler versions of the reward. Maybe it only depends on ST or only depends on the action. Uh, that depends a little bit, um, but that's uh, what we call the reward. And now the question is, is this reward uh, that depends on the full time step, uh, is it a reward at time t or t plus one? And again, there are different definitions in the literature. So I want to follow the definition in a certain book by Sutton and Barto, and then it's RT plus one. Okay, so just to make this clear. Now, the rewards are defined. You have to define the rewards in a smart way so that a high reward means you're going close to your goal. Now it has to be said, this is the reward at a certain time step. What you're really interested in is the overall reward over all the trajectories summed up. So that uh, leads us to something we call the return. And this is something that I call capital R, which is just the cumulative reward. So you sum all the rewards. Now I have to look at the proper index. So you go from uh, initial time to final time and you sum all the rewards. And of course, the goal of reinforcement learning will be to make sure that this reward is on average, because it's stochastic, as large as possible. 
So the idea being that running a single trajectory is running a, like running a game once. You do it many times, you always record the return and that is your average return. Now you change your policy, you run it again many times, you get another return and hopefully the second return will be larger and you're trying to optimize this average return. So that's the whole thing in reinforcement learning. And the question is how to get there, which strategies should we apply in order to optimize the average return. Okay, I see the time for today is already up, but we are at a very good point. We have defined all the ingredients. And so then uh, there's still a little bit more to say about these basics, but then uh, next time we can really go into discussing what are the simplest methods to do reinforcement learning and then what are the more advanced methods. Okay, any question? Okay, so at the moment, I don't see questions, but maybe as a little extra homework, just think of interesting problems in any kind of field that you could imagine solving using reinforcement learning. Okay, so then uh, see you on Wednesday. <laughs>